seeing some uh, familiar names in the uh, participants uh, list. Yeah, it's been nice to see a lot of returning visitors, returning uh, viewers, I mean. We'll give it a couple minutes, everybody. Get situated. Now, if I should uh, check my email for the last minute, I can't get in uh, messages or. Uh... <laughs> it's a good no, idea. Looks like we're good. Yeah. Sometimes it's better not to know. <laughs> right. I make that mistake every weekend checking my email and it's it's the worst. <laughs> yeah. Oh, got a couple of questions about the uh, tonight's talk, so I'll respond throughout. Yeah, or three, which is nice. Making sure we're recording it, that's all. Yes, we are. Hi, Keith, how you doing? <clears throat> doing well, thank you so much for asking. Keith wants to know if he'll learn enough to uh, build a three-masted schooner. Um, we might not get that far today, um, but uh, we're starting in uh, the Stone Age, so uh, you should be uh, fluent in uh, some of the uh, the basic forms by the end of the uh, uh, the first hour. There you <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I was just reading that as you responded. <laughs> Good stuff. <clears throat> I looked down for a second, about five people joined. That's awesome. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. <clears throat> Very good. And like I said if, uh, a couple minutes ago, we'll get started in just a, a minute or two. Let people get situated. So again, thank you for, uh, for joining us this evening. Oh, wow. That's really cool, Keith. gonna mute myself real quick because I'm responding to a to a message. Sure. He might be with <laughs> Bill. 
Question here from Keith, should I start out sailing with a catamaran? I can get one free. Um, without knowing the specifics, um, a free boat is usually not free, <laughs> in my experience anyways. Um, however, um, a catamaran is, uh, generally speaking, a good stable design. So you get a, a nice wide foundation without too much draft. And it's, uh, you know, got a lot of inherent stability. So you can do a lot worse. All right, Joe, um, it's about uh, three after, so if you're ready, would you like to get started? Sure, yeah, and uh, anybody joining later can just catch up with the rest of us. Right, let's get their, uh, the screen share going. All right, Chuck, not if you can uh, see that. Yep, we're good to go. Okay, let's get rolling. <clears throat> so this class is uh, called Introduction to Wooden Shipbuilding, um, and hopefully it'll uh, meet everybody's expectations for what an introduction to wooden shipbuilding actually entails. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the technology involved in a, a broad sweep of uh, um, shipbuilding traditions throughout most of history. Um, so if you're looking for practical advice, on how to uh, build a square egg ship in your backyard. We might not get terribly far into that, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, get you off on the right path at least. And of course our boilerplate, um, the flagship Niagara League is a 501c3 nonprofit associates group of the uh, Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. And uh, we, uh, operate the ships at the Erie Maritime Museum. So uh, feel free to visit our website, sailfnl.org for more information, to join, to uh, buy your don't give up the ship uh, merchandise and things like that. So my name is uh, Joe Langeza. I'm the director of sail training with the flagship Niagara League. Um, feel free to email me. Um, and this uh, meeting is being uh, moderated by uh, Charles Johnson, who is the uh, educator and volunteer coordinator at, at the museum. And uh, I assume he's uh, reasonably uh, happy to get emails from you as well. Um, I think we'll both say uh, Google at first, but uh, yeah, we're always happy to talk shop. So um, we'd like you to, if you haven't, um, consider visiting us. The, uh, the Maritime Museum opened for the first time in a while uh, this past Friday, and they're currently doing two days a week. And uh, the uh, flagship Niagara League will be operating our ships as soon as we can. So currently it looks like the Letty G. Howard, the uh, schooner we uh, uh, operate in collaboration with South Street Seaport Museum in New York. Um, we're looking at having that up and running in the next month or so. Um, Niagara is a more complex piece of machinery. needs more crew, uh, more assembly. So that might, be further down the road, we'll see. Um, watch the newspaper, or watch uh, our Facebook page. And the schedule is uh, pretty straightforward. We're gonna be doing every Tuesday in May, um, six o'clock um, our time here in Erie, Eastern Daylight Time. And uh, by and by, we'll get the recordings posted, um, probably on YouTube. We'll see how the, uh, the file size looks and uh, I'm uh, considering this, uh, this class an experiment for probably a longer course in the autumn. So I'll be happy to hear what you thought was uh, worthwhile, what you thought was maybe less worthwhile, and uh, the general direction of things. And the course goals. I would like to um, get into the broad trends in the development of wooden ships and shipbuilding in the Mediterranean and Atlantic world traditions. So the Mediterranean is of course the, uh, the sea between uh, uh, Southern Europe and Northern Africa. Um, <clears throat> and the Atlantic world in the parlance is uh, 
the place is connected by the Atlantic Ocean. So largely uh, the colonial powers of Europe, um, the colonized areas of North America, South America, Africa, and the interchange of ideas and technologies and people and ideas um, in, in that shipbuilding and maritime cultural sphere. Um, I like to talk a lot about how material and context inform how a vessel is made, um, which is to say how what you get is largely a product of the materials you start with and the job it has to do on what kind of uh, waterway. Um, a little further into the class, we'll get into some of the basic technological elements of uh, wooden ships. And uh, I think uh, the part I'm looking forward to the most is just talking about cool things in history. So um, pulling out uh, some of the files in the filing cabinet and talking about the uh, ships I find remarkable from uh, the archeological and historical record. And uh, just in terms of uh, some standard points of reference, um, generally people these days are going to write and uh, um, use uh, the, the terms common era and before common era. Um, the precursors AD and BC, Anno Domini, literally year of our Lord in Latin and before Christ um, are no longer in wide academic use because we want to include people from, you know, traditions other than uh, the Christian one. Um, however, I will backslide probably at some point because uh, it's uh, old habit. Um, sometimes in archeology archeology uh, and uh, in other fields which use uh, radiocarbon testing um, like geology, um, you'll see the terminology before present. And that just means before the advent of nuclear testing. So BP is before January 1st, 1950 sort of a generic date that was established <clears throat> as the beginning of the nuclear age. Um, I find functionally when we're talking about um, especially uh, Stone Age, Bronze Age, um, a long time ago, 50 years, 70 years more or less doesn't make much of a difference. Um, and I'm gonna focus more on broad trends than specific dates, especially as we go really far back. Um, I think an imperial, so feet and inches, um, but I'll try to include my best guesstimate of metric um, as we go on for our uh, international um, viewers. And uh, um, well, again, feel free to Google if you don't trust my, my mental math. And uh, this is a quote which um, is from Keith McElroy, who's uh, a founding figure in maritime archaeology. Um, sort of the Buddy Holly of uh, underwater archaeology in a lot of ways, and that he uh, um, was a foundational figure in the new field. Um, underwater archaeology largely started when uh, we invented scuba equipment um, in the middle of the last century. And uh, he, uh, in a lot of ways, uh, set the foundation of the field or was a big contributor, and he uh, suffered an untimely early death um, in a a diving accident, but uh, um, in any pre-industrial society from the Upper Paleolithic to uh, the 19th century AD, a boat or later a ship was the largest and most complex machine produced. Um, I think that's an idea which still holds true today if you use a broader definition of ship as uh, something that includes uh, airships and spaceships. Um, I, I challenge you to find a, a more uh, tightly uh, bundled together piece of advanced technologies than uh, say the space shuttle um, or um, whatever uh, Elon Musk is building uh, in his uh, Bond villain uh, laboratory these days. So um, besides the fact that I think all of us here, I think boats are cool. Um, a ship is an interesting sample of the the most advanced things that a, a civilization could bring to bear on a problem at any given point. And <clears throat> not a tremendous length, but briefly, I'd like to talk about uh, my resume a little bit. So you have a sense of what I might know, what I might not know, where to trust me, where to not trust me, 
and uh, where to do your own research. So um, on and off for the past 20 plus years, uh, coming up on 25 here, I guess, um, I've worked for the uh, Brig Niagara, um, starting as a volunteer, uh, moving all the way up to uh, now uh, captain of a desk and uh, most of the roles in between. Niagara is a 19th century um, uh, reconstructed uh, wooden warship. So she's 198 feet overall, about 110 feet of the waterline, 12 stories tall, um, and uh, operates here in the Great Lakes of North America. Um, and uh, Niagara is a pretty good example of late stage wooden uh, ship development. So this is the second to last phase of wooden shipbuilding. Um, the last phase would be composite where you've got more iron, um, ferrous metal, steel being used in the, the structure of a ship. But in terms of wood on wood, some metal fasteners, um, this is about uh, the peak of that technology. And as we'll see, it's a, a technological tradition that runs back um, 10,000 years, something like that, um, at the very least, depending on where you, you know, draw the line between um, someone floating on a log and the first actual ship. Um, FNL op also operates the Lady G. Howard, which is a, a late 19th century fishing schooner. Um, <clears throat> similar era, different job. So you, you see reflected in these two different uh, vessels, um, different design priorities. So the, the needs of a gun platform are different than the needs of a fish catching machine. Um, and that um, along with the fact that Niagara is built for the lakes, uh, Letty is built for the open ocean, you end up using the same toolkit, the same materials to widely disparate vessels. Um, I don't usually uh, talk about this one, but my first job in the field was the Santa Maria in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, landlocked on uh, the Scioto River, which was, uh, you know, almost shallow enough you could walk across it. Um, so this was a purely static museum ship, but uh, um, it's the oldest example of uh, uh, sailing ship in, in my personal resume. Um, I worked for a number of years on the Pride of Baltimore II, um, which is a replica 1813 uh, era privateer. Um, modeled after the Chasseur, uh, Baltimore Clipper, uh, sailed out of Baltimore, fought in the War of 1812. And I uh, did an Atlantic, an Atlantic crossing on that, um, ranged up and down the East Coast and into the Great Lakes a number of times. And uh, I was part of the rebuild after the ship was uh, dismasted off of the uh, coast of France. So I wasn't actually there when the uh, rig came out but uh, I did get called up and uh, uh, reactivated as it were when it was time to uh, build and put in a new rig. So uh, I was uh, lucky enough to be a part of that and uh, be stuck in France for uh, uh, something like half a year as a result. Um, also worked on the Highlander Sea, which is a 1920s, uh, 26 off the top of my head, uh, uh, New England pilot schooner. Um, as you can see, it's uh, very, very aggressively rigged, a lot of sail up there. And uh, about 15 years ago or so, I was part of the project that essentially put a new bottom on the boat. So uh, you're looking at uh, the last, uh, the lowest four or five strikes on the, on the, um, on the planking on what looks like the port side maybe. Um, you can see the, uh, the new oak frames, the new oak planks and pretty much everything below the waterline was replaced. Um, so between Highlander and Pride, I've uh, been involved in putting a new top on a ship and a new bottom on a ship. Um, so I guess it's a case of the excluded middle, but uh, I've been a laborer anyways on a couple of big projects. And it was also the rigor on the USS Constellation, which is the last, uh, um, all wooden sailing ship or all sail powered uh, ship in the US Navy. Um, it's uh, I believe 199 feet overall, 180 or so at the water line, big beamy vessel, um, about 1400 uh, 
uh, tons uh, uh, displacement and uh, really a large example of shipbuilding. So uh, it would be uh, about the biggest thing you'd see in, in the American Navy um, in uh, the wooden era. And uh, it's, it's only the, the real imperial powers that have ships that are two, three sizes bigger than this. Um, and although I was nominally the rigger, I spent a lot of time as just a, a normal goon in the, the carpentry squad because it's a big, very old ship and a lot of things needed replacing. Um, and it was just a continual battle to uh, um, put lumber onto the ship faster than they could run off. So what you're looking at here is a project we did where we um, replaced a band around the gun ports. That uh, ladder there is uh, sticking out one of the gun ports. So all around the, uh, the gun deck where the last restoration stopped, um, there was uh, after about a 10 year period, a fair amount of rod accumulating and uh, just chopping out large pieces of uh, um, old growth timber and putting in new ones. Um, and I also have a degree in uh, uh, maritime studies, which means uh, underwater archaeology, uh, maritime archaeology from East Carolina University. And this is an example of the kind of boat I would have been working on there. You can see there's sort of an outline of something iron in the water. Um, a lot of times we'd be looking at something that was maybe a ship at one point, hard to tell, could have been a dock, just a pile of uh, rotten sharp things uh, 100 years later. Um, but I do have uh, academic and practical experience in maritime archeology. span um, And basically the point of that is that I am not a, uh, not a practicing archeologist, not a practicing historian, um, but I have painted or hit with a hammer just about every part of a ship uh, you, can, you can name. And I've operated um, a pretty decent selection of uh, sort of uh, long 19th century ships. <clears throat> so some terminology here. Um, what's a boat, what's a ship? Um, this is something you can easily get into an argument over. Um, both uh, words come to us from uh, Old English. Uh, I think uh, boat uh, and uh, ship uh, or a boot and ship uh, um, in Old English, although it's been a while. And generally, um, a boat is smaller than a ship. And where the cutoff between one and the other is, um, that's where the trouble starts. Um, I like to think of boat as a diminutive, diminutive uh, form of ship, like man and boy. So there are contexts in which you can call a man a boy, and uh, it's correct. There are contexts in which it's incorrect. Um, so a man can be a boyfriend, um, a bat boy um, by convention in a baseball team. You're always boy, even if you're 70 years old, if you're the bat boy. Um, the captain of a ship is always the old man, even if the uh, old man happens to be a young woman. Um, so, So generally, uh, boat is a diminutive, but there are contexts in which a ship is a boat. So submarines are always boats. Uh, tugboats are always boats, even if they're ship size. Um, what else? Uh, freighters on the Great Lakes here are typically called lake boats. Um, that's the standard usage up here uh, in the north. Um, so something a thousand feet long can be called a boat. Um, here in uh, Western Pennsylvania. Um, I'm not gonna get too hung up on, uh, on what we're calling each individual uh, vessel we're talking about um, because uh, it's contextual too. So if we're talking about something that was built uh, 1,000, 2,000 years ago, that line is slid back and forth between what, what's big and what's small, what's a boat, what's a ship. Um, in archaeology, you tend to uh, see most often the words vessel and watercraft, which uh, don't have the same um, connotations coming along with them, but it's, uh, it's a little stuffy. And when we're talking about a boat, a ship, or a watercraft, what are we talking about? Um, I scratched my head and I came up with uh, a pretty short list of uh, what I, I consider defining characteristics. So a boat is not uh, an artifact. 
it's made by human hands. So a whale would fulfill potentially the rest of this list, but it's not a boat because it's not handmade. Um, a boat provides flotation. It doesn't have to be a lot of it, um, um, or it can be a great deal. Um, I guess I should say something like buoyancy, perhaps, if we're going to include submarines. Um, I, feel like, I feel like this is the setup to a perfect Monty Python joke, and we're just completely missing it. <laughs> a duck. So usually uh, some directional control, it uh, doesn't have to be perfect. Um, so anybody who's been on a sailing ship will know that uh, usually you don't have complete directional control. Um, often you can't go where you wanna go, but you have some say in uh, which wrong direction you're going. And uh, we'll often have some means of propulsion, although not necessarily. I'd say barges or boats uh, or ships. Um, but a lot of times it'll have, uh, you know, uh, a sail, an engine, uh, an oar, um, something that propels. So uh, using these broad terms, we can start talking about um, the earliest watercraft and roll into the earliest uh, examples of wooden shipbuilding. And we'll talk about why a vessel turns out the way it turns out. Um, because every, every boat, every ship is a, a compromise between um, the, the technology and money you have on hand, um, the set of material you have to work with, um, the problem you're trying to solve, and the place you're trying to solve it. So people will often just say to me something along the lines of, uh, oh, isn't Niagara a great ship? And I say, yeah because she's a great ship in a narrow context, um, in the uh, specific context of um, not a lot of wind, summer days on the Great Lakes. She's, uh, Niagara is a very appropriate answer to the question of how to get uh, uh, 20 cannon from point A to point B. But, she's, but Niagara is not broadly um, appropriate in uh, a large number of situations. Um, it's not a good ocean going vessel. Um, it's not a good uh, living on board vessel um, compared to some other examples. Um, it's a good sail training vessel because it's uh, um, overly rigged and inconvenient and that's how you learn by doing things in hard mode. Um, but um, given these inputs, um, you'll see that um, cultures throughout uh, the historical and archeological rec uh, record will be answering similar questions in similar ways. And I think the broadest impact on the end result of, in maritime technology is the material technology that goes into it. Um, material technology, what, what does that mean? Well, whether your tools are stone or bronze or steel, whether you have access to um, iron fasteners, whether you can nail things together or you have to peg it together with wood, um, whether you have synthetic uh, 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 polymers and uh, fibers to make uh, sails and rope and things like that out of, whether you have engines. Um, so I'd say the biggest uh, difference between, um, we'll be looking at Egyptian, uh, ancient Egyptian shipbuilding a little later here between shipbuilding technology in ancient Egypt and shipbuilding technology in the Great Lakes um, just 200 years ago is whether there was access to uh, uh, the steel industry. Um, all of the, the engineering uh, uh, differences are largely um, secondary to, in, in these two examples, the materials the two cultures had to work with. Um, and I think when we look at things as we go on as um, products of the material that goes into the vessel, the uh, problem it's meant to solve and the place it's meant to solve it, um, we'll have a lot better uh, chance of understanding each resultant ship as uh, addressing these three questions. So we think the, uh, 
the earliest thing you could call a ship would be uh, something like this, ship, boat, whatever. Um, this is a uh, reconstruction of a uh, Stone Age um, raft. Um, you can see in, in terms of hull shape, it's not very defined. Um, I don't think there's anything like this in the archaeological record. Um, so it would be largely guesswork on someone's part. But uh, we'd guess that the earliest seafarers were using something like this. Uh, aside from the first uh, you know, human or proto-human that uh, um, clung onto a log floating down a, a river and thought, hey, this has potential. Um, the, the first step would be tying a few logs together and you're, you're into the beginning of the wooden shipbuilding uh, tradition. Um, also in uh, early examples, you're going to see um, boats or flotation um, made out of uh, pottery, uh, ceramics, or uh, leather. Uh, so this is uh, an example from uh, ancient Assyria. This is about 700, 700 uh, um, BCE. And uh, this sort of uh, vessel is uh, called a kephet. Um, it's a wooden raft. And the, uh, the objects you can see uh, supporting the, uh, the platform there and supporting the, the one uh, gentleman who's, uh, who's swimming there are uh, animal hides that have been sewn up, uh, probably sealed with uh, something like wax or, uh, or pitch and uh, inflated. Um, and you'll still see examples of this sort of approach to uh, ship construction today in floating docks, which are like this with uh, um, plastic uh, buoyancy underneath the raft instead of uh, animal hides. Um, and in terms of ceramics, it's, it's a little um, counterintuitive, um, but we know in the ancient Middle East, people were using uh, pottery for flotation. So imagine taking your, uh, your mother's best uh, stock pot, kind of clamp it on your chest, and you've got, a, you've got a swim support, and you're free to try this in your swimming pool uh, after the class if uh, uh, you hold this harmless for the results. But uh, you see these early examples of uh, providing flotation by capturing, um, capturing air in a vessel like an animal, animal skin or uh, a, a, a pot, basically. Um, and it's a little bit of a jump to uh, building up a, uh, a wooden or later steel, what have you, um, vessel to uh, to hold uh, flotation, but uh, but we get there. Um, probably most of the wooden shipbuilding traditions in the world, um, and again, my limited expertise is mostly the European tradition, Mediterranean, Atlantic world. Um, most of these shipbuilding traditions are starting with something like a dugout canoe. Um, so this is uh, an example um, that was built in Pennsylvania by PH PHMC a number of years ago. Um, but you take a large log, um, you hollow out the middle so uh, one or more uh, uh, people can sit in it with uh, whatever cargo they have. You uh, make some attempt at rounding off the front and the back and you have a, you have a boat. Um, these are possible to make with stone tools. The easy way, easiest way to go about it is to uh, light small fires along the top, um, weaken the, the structure of the wood, and then scoop it out with whatever you have, um, stone, shell, uh, metal tool. Um, so assuming you've got the raw materials, this is something most of you could uh, construct in your uh, backyard before the next class um, with you know, a couple hundred hours of labor. Um, and from this foundational um, technology, um, you start developing outwards and upwards. So it's not a big uh, mental leap to, uh, you know, look at something like a dugout canoe here and think, well, this would keep the water out a little better, be a little safer if I built the sides up a little bit. So adding, you know, a plank or two on each side bringing up the, uh, the whales a couple of inches and having a little more stability, a little more protection. And then it's another mental step from there to put another piece of wood on top of that. And sooner or later, you're building up and out and uh, the, uh, the original dugout canoe becomes a keel, uh, becomes the, the structural backbone of something much larger and more complex. 
And in uh, underwater archaeology, we talk about three basic shipbuilding traditions, um, shell first, frame first, and the somewhat obscure, but uh, still traditionally on the list, bottom first. Um, in shell first construction, you build the shell first. You build the outside um, by attaching the planks to each other, um, edge joining usually. And then you fill in the, uh, the skeleton afterwards. Uh, you reinforce. And this is what you're going to see um, in a lot of ancient traditions um, and uh, uh, certainly in this class and the next class. Excuse me. Um, and it's a good technology, but it's um, very labor intensive. Um, what you see in later examples, like everything I've worked on, like Niagara, is frame first where you build out the uh, structural um, backbone of the ship first, you lay the keel, you build up the ribs and the stem post and the stern post at either end, and then you wrap around that with planking. Um, and that um, is a, a faster, simpler way to do things, assuming you have the capacity to uh, cut down lumber on a more or less industrial scale. And then bottom first, which is, uh, I think, only seen in uh, sort of low countries, Northern Europe. Um, you uh, lay a foundation of a, uh, a flat bottom, and then you build stake sides, essentially, around it. You uh, build up um, at more or less right angles, depending, um, and build the sides up from there. And uh, I think we'll hit on one or two examples of that later on, but uh, um, largely we'll be talking about shell first then frame first. So um, one of the, well, the first great maritime culture in the world was ancient Egypt. Egypt. And uh, I, think, I think most of us, we think about Egypt, we think about this. We think about desert, we think about pyramids, camels, the Sphinx. We don't think maritime. Um, uh, it's not the first thing that jumps into your head. It's a little counterintuitive because of the image of a desert country. Um, but in fact, um, ancient Egypt over a long period of time was based around the Nile base. Um, so the Nile River, you can see here that green swath is the um, is the arable um, irrigated uh, um, strip of land between the desert and uh, that's where the uh, Egyptian culture, Egyptian economy um, and uh, um, main trade route was was based. And uh, with the Nile River, you have rather conveniently, um, you don't have a lot of storms, um, for one thing, and you have the uh, the fact that um, the river flows north towards the uh, the Mediterranean, but the prevailing winds go the other direction. Um, and I'd say most of the time they're either going uh, flowing uh, from the north to the south, or in such a way that you can sail going southbound. So you have a very natural. Um, um, highway um, connecting Upper Egypt to Lower Egypt, um, connecting the Mediterranean to uh, Point South. And we see in uh, ancient Egypt, um, shipbuilding develops very early um, and boat building, not as much in the archeological record, but uh, develops quite early as well. So the first examples of these would be in all likelihood reed boats. Um, and in this example, you can see these uh, these gentlemen are uh, lashing together papyrus reeds. Um, it's uh, rope technology effectively, um, but it's the same concept as the, uh, as the raft we uh, glanced at uh, earlier. Um, and you're going to see um, Egyptian shipbuilding technology um, come from this basis rather than, as in most of the examples we'll talk about in future classes, the dugout canoe for the simple reason that Egypt uh, is and always has been fairly short on trees. 
Um, so when we do get into wooden shipbuilding in Egypt, it's um, very parsimonious use of lumber. Um, it's uh, using, using every part of the tree, um, importing lumber at great expense in some cases, and it's flowing formally um, from this earliest example of the, uh, the tradition, the reed bow. Probably the uh, oldest uh, ship we're ever gonna find is uh, uh, the uh, uh, Pharaoh Khufu or uh, Cheops in Greek. Uh, Khufu is a solar barge. Um, this was uh, buried at his pyramid, which is the Great Pyramid, the big one um, in Giza. And um, that would have been roughly 2600 BCE. So uh, four and a half coming on 5,000 years ago. Um, it's a long time. Um, this uh, ship would have uh, been built uh, almost a thousand years uh, before the woolly mammoth went extinct uh, to put it in a little bit of uh, context. Um, at this point, uh, Egypt is a bronze age society. They have metal tools, but they're not necessarily the, uh, the best, not necessarily the, uh, the sharpest or uh, hardest wearing. And you would be seeing stone tools still being used in a lot of uh, a lot of context. So this barge is an example of wooden shipbuilding on a fairly large scale. Um, it's about 120 feet, 40 meters long. Um, and uh, we think it was uh, used in the uh, funeral um, rituals associated with bearing the Pharaoh Khufu. Um, we think it's meant to mirror the, uh, the ship that the, uh, the sun god Ra uh, used to pilot the sun across the sky every day in Egyptian mythology. Um, so it's, it's unclear exactly how much this reflects um, a more vernacular, a more working man's type of boat. Um, if this is you know, sort of widely disparate from uh, the, the common types of vessels, or if it's just uh, a slightly fancified version of what uh, trade craft would have looked like uh, at that time. But it is a wooden ship, definitely. And it's put together in a very interesting way. And this is the first example we're gonna see of shell first technology. And uh, looking at this uh, cross section here, the, uh, the planks were joined together. Um, they were edge joined with uh, basically uh, a series of small dowels um, just to hold them in place effectively. Um, and then phase two, it was all lashed together. So this is part of the stone boat tradition. It's sewn together the same way a reed boat would have been, um, sewn together the same way a birch bark canoe or a modern stitch and, stitch and glue canoe would be. Um, so you can see that uh, there are a series of holes that have been bored partway through the planks. And these are um, using the battens that are labeled C in this drawing here, um, lashing the planks together. And then you have framing, uh, basically with a floor at the bottom added um, at a later stage and then deck beams and carlings um, binding the top together at the last stage before finishing. And here is another um, view of basically the, the same uh, cross section. Um, and you can see the remains of the planks, the battens um, and the timbers uh, added as framing later. And excuse me. This is a uh, sort of construction method that we see throughout um, basically the ancient Egyptian period. Um, so uh, uh, Khufu was an uh, old kingdom, uh, 2500 roughly uh, BCE. Um, this is an example of uh, um, a later uh, Egyptian vessel 
uh, hat, hat shep suit. Um, that's that's going to be one I'm going to trip over after uh, talking for uh, 30, 40 minutes here. But um, the Egyptians are developing a maritime culture that is occasionally an ocean going uh, culture. So uh, this example, um, uh, Queen uh, Hatshepsut, Queen H, she's often called for just this reason, uh, was the uh, queen king, uh, uh, pharaoh of uh, ancient Egypt um, in roughly 1500 BC. Um, and uh, how she got to be uh, pharaoh and queen king, despite being uh, uh, not male, uh, is an interesting story. And if uh, this were a gender studies or a political science class, we'd get a whole month out of it. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, um, she uh, uh, smartly, we think, uh, wielded a lot of power and influence. And part of that was uh, doing sort of moonshot projects. Um, and uh, one of the things she did was send a fleet of five ocean going vessels to the uh, land of uh, Punt, um, which we think is uh, Somalia, uh, Ethiopia, somewhere in that region in the Horn of Africa. Um, and bringing back uh, the, uh, the treasures that were available there. So um, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, um, ebony, um, exotic animals uh, like um, apes, cheetahs, what have you. Um, this is something Egyptian culture did periodically um, but not often. Um, I think it would be the equivalent of, again, going to the moon for our civilization, something which is uh, in the range of our technological abilities, but sort of at the outer limits and definitely a flashy statement. So um, during the, the reign of Queen H, um, she built uh, five of these vessels. They were built on the Nile. They were carried overland to the Red Sea and they sailed on the ocean to, uh, um, we think, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, and back, um, bearing back priceless things um, and uh, earning uh, the queen great acclaim and uh, definitely making a statement. And this actually is a ship that uh, has been uh, built in replica form. So when I look at this, um, I see all of the technology that you see on Niagara in a basic form. So someone from a 19th century sailing ship would be able to operate this. Somebody from this three and a half thousand year old ship would be able to warm up to a 19th century sailing ship and have their bearings there pretty quickly. Um, it's all the same principles, it's all the technology. It's just, as you go further down in history, things stack up more. So instead of having one square sail, Niagara has eight, um, but all the principles are there. Um, some of the interesting diagnostic features on this is, are you can see that uh, this, uh, this later wood built type um, retains the, uh, the high bow and stern that you would find in a reed boat. Uh, we think that's somewhat aesthetic, but it's also good for beaching. Um, and running along the middle, uh, down the middle of the deck, there is a, uh, a piece of rope um, that's being held up on uh, little bridging timbers. Um, that's uh, a truss. And what that is doing is it's like a suspension bridge. It's pulling the, the front and the back of the ship towards the middle. Um, and holding the holding the ends up essentially. Um, it's a technology you see in later like 19th century riverboats. Um, but this is where we begin to see wooden ships that uh, I think we will begin to recognize as antecedents of the things that uh, we're, we're still operating today, um, at least as replicas here in uh, the Great Lakes. So uh, Chuck, are you still there? Yes, I am. All right. Well, um, I've, uh, I think, uh, gotten one foot in the water anyways, and then we'll have more to talk about next week. But uh, 
Um, if uh, you want to maybe uh, see if there are any questions, I'll uh, catch my uh, voice a little bit. Yeah. So um, I know that we have a couple here. Let me just uh, get this pulled back up. Yeah. So Daniel is asking, uh, he was wondering if any research has been done to the technological innovations, if any, that uh, the Brown brothers, I'm, I'm assuming Adam and Noah, um, applied to the Briggs uh, built during the war and later steamboats, walk in water and superior. Um, I myself don't know of any research that's been done, but Joe, I mean, do you have an answer to that? Short answer, no, I don't. Yeah, neither do I. Um, let me see. I, I, I apologize, Daniel. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, let me, <clears throat> Replanking is time consuming. Uh, do you want to hit on that real quick? Replanking is time consuming. Um, this might be in reference to the Highlander Sea. I think so. Yeah. Everything's time consuming. <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if as you look at history, you just you realize none of these none of these poor humans doing these jobs were making fifty bucks an hour. Right. <laughs> they were getting you know a, a bowl of grill every day, and that's how you you know that's how you build a ship. Um, that's how you build the pyramids um, by having really low cost labor. Um, replanking the Highlander Sea was tremendously expensive. Um, it wasn't my money, but uh, it was uh, millions of dollars um, and uh, took over a year and uh, probably knocked down a small forest of uh, American oak uh, yeah. doing it. Um, and the, the previous iteration had been I think there was a lot of red oak used, um, which is uh, typically a no-no as a shipbuilding wood, but, uh, you know, lasted for a couple of decades. So it was apparently good enough. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've done enough replanking to, to agree that it's, it's time consuming. Yeah. I, um, in my previous employment, I, I worked at the Battleship Massachusetts and, um, you know, it's, it's been sitting in, in salt water for the last 75 years. And, uh, um, you know, part of what we had wanted to do was to retake the deck of the battleship. And uh, we got it quoted for, I think, $15 million, um, which you work for a nonprofit. Um, you know how hard it is to come up with one fifteenth of that. <laughs> That's still something that they're working on, $15 million. And I know that the, um, the Missouri... Uh, is currently being retaked, um, and they've been doing it, or I think it's Missouri, um, they've been doing it for a couple of years now, so um, yeah. Um, Keith, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember which which barge um, you're asking about, um, but uh, maybe you remember, uh, Joe, barge is beautiful, what type of wood um, would have been used to construct it? This was, this was asked about 10 minutes ago. Uh, that would be uh, uh, Khufu's uh, barge. Okay, yes. <laughs> So Egyptian uh, shipbuilding, um, you're looking at um, acacia is the best native species. And that's kind of a scrubby, bushy tree compared to everything we prefer for shipbuilding. It's good wood, but you don't get a lot of long, straight lengths. Um, and um, the bigger examples, they're exporting, they're importing rather uh, cedar, um, things like that from, uh, uh, Lebanon, the, the Near East, um, at great expense. Um, so you end up with a, a technique that's called uh, uh, jongling, I think, joggling, jongling, um, where the ship is put together. Let me back up. When we plank a ship, we cut the planks more or less square, you know, uniform thickness and width. They taper a little bit as the ends as the boat comes to a point but squarish, uniform, and stack them evenly. They're getting the most they can out of every piece of lumber. And it's this weird jigsaw puzzle of non-standard, non-straight non shapes, you know, triangular here and whatever uh, stuck together. Um, and, you know, maximizing the, the timber they have on hand. 
but uh, short answer, um, probably cedar, something like that, or acacia in smaller examples. Uh, and Keith continued, to, acacia doesn't rot, right? It's it's a very uh, it's a very good uh, rot resistant wood. It just doesn't grow very long or uh, straight. Yeah, uh, Wyatt's asking, why is there no rake in the main and foremost of the FNL logo? Because it's a generic ship <laughs> designed by a graphic design company and it looks fine. <laughs> have to double check that. Uh, yeah. if, does anybody have any other questions? Those are the ones that have come through. It's a lot of information that you just you just went through, and I can feel the dryness in your throat from all the way over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Daniel's asking: To what extent did historical shipwrights work from molds? plans versus just winging it? Short answer, they were just winging it. Um, long answer, you start to see the application of science to shipbuilding around 1750. Um, plans and models were in use before that. But, um, you know, plans are something that's to a certain degree predicated on being literate. Um, and in societies where time happens differently, progress happens differently. Um, so in ancient Egypt, for example, there's not an appreciable difference between 5,000 years ago and 4,000 years ago. Uh, there's not a lot of advance um, in technology. Um, so uh, certainly not a quick advance. Um, so you'd kind of work it out over a thousand years, trial and error. And once you found something that worked, you kept doing it. Um, and I don't think, I don't think off the top of my head, grad school was a long time ago. I think you start seeing models around the Renaissance. Okay. Chuck, does uh, that sound about right? That sounds about right. Um, let me just see what's coming through. Uh, Jennifer's asking, as late as 1750, you mean the Elizabethan shipbuilders were more or less winging it, or did I hear you wrong? 1750 was uh, when, 1750-ish, um, I'm going to go with Bouguer in France as my, uh, um, as my date in history, is when you start seeing scientific uh, principles and what we'd call R&D, um, applied to uh, ship, shipbuilding as a matter of national interest. So research into how, how water resistant works, how wind works. Um, you, that's, that's the first example I've seen of a table that shows that uh, the force of the wind is the square of the speed of the wind. Um, you have you know, mathematical um, inquiry into what the best shape for going into the water, going through the water is, what the you know, best, um, most efficient size for a tiller is relative to a vessel. Um, that's where science gets involved. Um, so before that, they weren't necessarily winging it, winging it, but they were doing it based on precedence and principle um, more than, you know, doing something in a, um, abstract realm first. Yeah, the, the applied science. <clears throat> um, Chris is asking, uh, and this is for context, most of his questions are centered around men of war uh, in the late 1700s, uh, or the, in the 1700s to late 1800s. Um, Fuddock hall chambers versus Fuddock shrouds. Is there a similarity in function that would lead to the use of the same name? <sighs> I don't think so. Um, no, I'm failing to think of uh, how the two are analogous. Um, it's it's probably all these funny maritime words we have are usually from Old English, or you know they've been in the language for a very long time, and so I I couldn't point out what the connection is there. 
Right. And he's got a few questions. And Chris, um, I'm just going to pick a couple. And then if you could just email us um, the rest of them, um, that would be fine. Um, and we get those answered for you. Um, Chris is asking, and I'm going to try to keep this. Uh, yeah. Um, what have friendships, what have friendships there? I'm reading this wrong. What have friendships, their apparatus, superior lines, halls? I'm, I'm assuming what gave friendships, and you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. What gave friendships, their apparatus, superior lines and halls? Um, <laughs> research. Um, it's at at that point at at the Napoleonic uh, era certainly. Um, having a good Navy was a key matter of national interest. And so, you know, an expert on, on that period could give you a better answer. But um, the, the major colonial powers put a lot of effort into building the best ships they could. And uh, there were a lot of small but additive innovations in shipbuilding, um, basic structure down to uh, the, the means which the smallest elements were assembled or operated. One moment. Um, and we're, we'll answer uh, one more question because we're buttoned right up to the uh, the seven o'clock hour. Um, <clears throat> why were ball works and foxels built up so late? Uh, Chris is asking that question. That's the uh, second one down, 655. If you're reading that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so I think we're talking about the tall castles um, at either end of uh, like a medieval ship. Right, right. Uh, like the Santa Maria, for example, or um, anything you're going to see in like 13, 14, 1500. Um, it's, it's a complicated um, set of uh, circumstances. I, I think a lot of times you, you have habit and superstition and practical reason all kind of running over each other. And it's hard to untangle them, especially at the end. Um, but these castles develop as uh, fighting platforms. Um, so you can shoot down and poke down at uh, people on other ships uh, and have the high ground. Um, medieval mariners had a real fear of being pooped, um, which is to say being overrun from behind by a sea. Um, so they liked the protection of a high stern and a, you know, a high bow. And that especially made sense in the, in the fact, uh, in the context of uh, them making wide bathtubby, not especially um, fine uh, or, or swift um, vessels as, as cargo ships um, and as, as bigger naval ships. Um, so they've, they've produced something that's, that's not really great at getting out of its own way so they they want a little uh, extra protection both ends to uh, kind of supplement that and that kind of ship the medieval cog what have you if you don't if you're not too fussy about where you're going or how long it's going to take to get there they're very protected and very very buoyant so you can you know if it's put together well you can go through just about anything and it just floats along like a cork you'll rattle around inside a little bit but they're you know, it's an okay solution to the problem. Right. Uh, I just uh, ordered a book and read a book, I should say. Um, I think it's just, I was looking for it back there. I think it's just called Medieval Maritime Warfare that goes into a lot of detail um, <clears throat> into uh, the rise of the forecastle um, and discussing its use and everything like that. But you nailed it, Joe, so I won't get into that too much. But uh, but yeah, um, I think... Uh, if we have oh seven o'clock now, we have time for one more question, Joe. Are you okay with that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Chris is asking, how did the uh, cable used in triremes to strengthen strengthen the hull work? <clears throat> um, we're we're talking about I think the hogging truss. I, I think the, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, how does it work? Um, think of an arch. You know, um, the I understand it. 
um, sort of uh, on a gut level, but I'm right. having trouble coming up with the words to uh, explain how it works. But uh, um, the as the ship tapers out towards the ends, it becomes less buoyant. So you have often heavy, but um, not trapping a lot of flotation, pointy ends. Mm -hmm. um, and those tend to hog down in the water um, because there's not a lot of flotation there. Um, and they can be, you know, beaten around by the waves because they're the most exposed parts through the ends. They're what hits first. Um, so uh, a hogging truss um, is just, it's, it's like a tourniquet that pulls the ends together by way of the middle and transfers some of that weight to uh, a post going down towards the middle of the ship. Um, hopefully that's semi-clear. Yeah, I was trying to find an image um, I've used in the past, uh, a diagram, a drawing to help describe that, but I'm not seeing it um, in my files. But anyway, I think you, I think you answered that yeah. as best as you could. <clears throat> um, yes, yeah, so I think that that covers it. And Chris, I've I've commented by my uh, email um, for you to to get the rest of your questions that we weren't able to to get to today. Um, so feel free to send me that email and, and we'll try to get those answered for you. But um, thank you, Joe. I think that was a really good start to, um, to this class. Um, and we're back next Tuesday, same time, same place. Um, this has been recorded. So um, once it's done, I'll start downloading and, and we'll get that file uploaded. Um, so if you want to rewatch, um, you can do so on our YouTube page. Um, probably by at least by the end of the week, um, hopefully. So, um, cause it does it take some time to upload, but, uh, Joe, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you everybody for coming and uh, we'll uh, hopefully uh, see folks back a week from now. Yeah, definitely. Thank you everybody. And, um, like Joe said, we'll see you. Thanks Joe. My pleasure.